Night leans down on the Hawaiian islands, and the people dance their history. Thousands of years of oral tradition are recorded in ancient chants, myths and legends, songs of heroines and gods. These are the rhythmic records of a people who for centuries had no written language. Our ancestors were Polynesians. They were master mariners who found their way to Hawaii by the stars and the feel of the moving sea. In great open sea voyages of 2,000 miles or more, they came to this place across the trackless tides. We know there was a migration to these islands, perhaps from the Marquesas sometime between 300 and 500 AD. Some believe there may have been a later migration, from the vicinity of Tahiti between 1100 and 1300, when sea captains in Europe still feared the edge of Earth. After more than a month of great hardship, the first group of adventurers sighted land. To them, the island seemed like a man standing at the edge of the ocean, his arms spread wide in welcome. The Polynesians had found a natural paradise an empty stage upon which they would play out the drama of their lives. It was from this encounter with the natural world that their myths evolved. Their gods, their songs, their view of the world and of themselves. These traditions became the heart of the Hawaiian culture that would reach from the ancient past to touch the present. Much of what those first wanderers saw and felt is still here for visitors to see and feel today. According to one legend, their first landfall was the Isle of Kauai. So enchantingly beautiful is Kauai, with its green-robed cliffs and magnificent valleys, that it is called the Garden Isle. Washed by the tears of clouds, this may have been God's original idea of what a tropic isle should be. From the heart of the island rises the cloud catcher, Vaiale Ali, the abode of the gods. Nearly a mile high with an average annual rainfall of 460 inches, Vaiale Ale is often the wettest spot on earth, the birthplace of a thousand streams. On Kauai, you are never far from the living crystal of flowing, falling, or cresting water. Below Vialiali Ali is Waimea Canyon. Four miles wide in places, the canyon weaves eight miles through the western side of the island, twisting and turning past haunted solitudes toward the sea.
course of a day, the sun creates a moving tapestry of light and shadow upon the canyon walls. When he visited here in 1866, Mark Twain called this place the Grand Canyon of the Pacific. Hiding within these mountain reaches are valleys more beautiful than any artist could ever capture. Rich, verdant, and alive with brilliant splashes of vivid color, filled with vast bouquets of fern and bougainvillea. The Iliao plant is found nowhere in the world except here on Kauai. Generally, the plant lives between 6 and 15 years, usually blooms only once, then dies. Goats were brought here by British explorers. Captain James Cook and later Captain George Vancouver used them as gifts for the island chiefs. With no natural predators, the goat population has multiplied over the years and today poses a threat to the canyon's ecology. Along the rugged north shore, great lava cliffs tower over the restless sea. The Nepali coast is a testament to the island's violent birth. Here and there, jagged ramparts rise like stone pinnacles hurled from the center of the earth. slopes above Nepali grows the Ohia Lehua tree. Its feathery red blossoms were sacred to Hawaiian chiefs, and they fashioned the flower into leis as offerings to Pele, goddess of the volcano. The art of weaving leis has survived in Kauai, in both story and in fact. Ermalee Pomroy is a master of this Hawaiian art. The creation of her leis begins with the gathering of the flowers. The Hawaiians, they didn't over abuse the gathering of these kinds of materials. They were very considerate about the environment. And now when I go out and gather these things that I use in my lays, I try to be careful. I try not to overuse what I'm gathering. With the Hawaiians, making a lay was a spontaneous thing. Whenever they went from one place to another place, if they were going to go to visit uh, one family in another area, they would walk along the beach or perhaps through the forest and they would stop along the wayside and just pick up some of these things and make a lei. The lei is given in love. It's given at times of, of festivities. It's given at times of sorrow. Lays are given to almost anyone. When you step off the plane, one of the first things that a visitor receives is a lay. And it's a lay of, of welcoming. My favorite lay is the lay, uh, lay vili. Vili means to uh, wind and to to secure your flowers onto a foundation. The reason why I like this lay is because you can use almost any kind of material in this lay. You create it as you go along. It's a beautiful lay. You wear this lay open-ended or closed. Uh, lay kui is to sew a lay with a needle and thread. The Hawaiians did not have a steel needle like we use now, but they did have needles made out of uh, fish bones, especially, and made out of the midrib of the coconut leaf, and this is their needle and thread. 
my mother had a wonderful garden and she would make a lay for my father almost every day. He would put it around his hat. Every morning she did this for him, every day. And this was given to him with love. Love is often the reason people journey up the Wailua River on Kauai's eastern shore, for the river leads to a legendary place where lovers often go. The river winds through hallowed hills and burial grounds and old gray sentinels of stone. At the upstream landing is Fern Grotto. Ancient Hawaiians are said to have worshipped here in the full of the moon. Today, Fern Grotto is a popular place for weddings. At the northernmost tip of Kauai is Kilauea Point, a wildlife refuge for frigate and other seabirds. This sanctuary is critical, for it is the only secure nesting site in the inhabited Hawaiian Islands. Though many ocean-going birds will stay at sea for five years at a time, they must nest on land. One of the most commonly seen of these birds is the red-footed booby. As a chick, it wears a coat of white down, After about two months, the down is replaced by smoke gray feathers. Within three years, the plumage again turns white, the color it will remain the rest of its life. The refuge is also the roost of an abundance of great frigate birds. Their wingspan can measure seven and a half feet greater than most men are tall. Frigate birds are also called men of war because they attack other seabirds and steal their food. Koa Ikea, or white-tailed tropic bird, 
is easily recognized by its graceful tail streamers. Its feathers were prized by ancient Hawaiians who attached them to the tops of long ceremonial poles. The koa ikea builds its nest high in the inaccessible cliffs of Kilauea. High upon Kilauea Point, above the cliffs where the tropic birds nest, is an old lighthouse. Built in 1913, its turning eye was the first beacon seen by mariners sailing east from Asia. It was also this light that many emigrants from the Orient saw when they came to work the sugarcane fields that lay green upon the hillsides and in the valleys of Kauai. For centuries, sugar grew wild in Hawaii. Then, about 1835, island entrepreneurs turned to agriculture. Sugar plantations were established. There was money to be made in cane, but the planters needed laborers to work the fields. After 1850, hundreds of thousands of laborers from Japan, the Philippines, Portugal, and other lands came to work the cane. Many thousands stayed and created a culture of unparalleled diversity. Among the first of the contract laborers to come to Hawaii were the Chinese. Hong Min He's family has lived on Kauai for more than a century. He started working in the cane fields as a young man and eventually became a supervisor for a sugar plantation. Most of the Chinese in Hawaii came from Canton, Guangdong province. My grandpa came from uh, Jungsan, uh, district about 1875, and he went to Pipikio Plantation. First, the Chinese came in. The Chinese were entrepreneur type. They fulfilled their contract. They went out and seek for well, some kind of a business of their own. They want to be on their own. Always trying to start some sort of business. Then the industry looked for other types of labor. They brought in some of the Portuguese and the Japanese, Filipinos, and Koreans. That's made for Hawaii the melting pot. Sugar has ruled Kauai's economy since 1835, but the oldest crop is taro. Most of Hawaii's taro is grown in the fertile valley of Hanalei, on Kauai's north shore. According to legend, the taro plant was born from the body of a god, a fitting tale, as taro was the most important food of the early Polynesian settlers who brought it to Hawaii in their hand-hewn canoes. When cooked, pounded, and kneaded, the enlarged taro corn becomes poi, the Hawaiian staff of life. After the plant is harvested, the leafy stem is saved and replanted to grow the next crop. In this way, the plant is continually reborn. Some families, like the Haraguchis, have farmed the Hanalei Valley for generations, using simple plows and methods that have changed little over the centuries. Farther along the coast are Kauai's fabled beaches. So beautiful and unspoiled, they have found their way into dozens of Hollywood movies. Farther still, Sunset falls on Hanalei Bay, as it has since Kauai was formed. Has a day passed? Or a thousand years? In the fading light, you can almost hear the song of the ancient Polynesians who were the first to come this way.
This dance tells the story of Pele, the goddess of fire, who once lived in another part of Polynesia. But she was stirred by thoughts of far away lands. One day, Pele left her family to begin a journey to find a new home. Searching far across the seas, she came to the island of Kauai. But Kauai was so wet that everywhere she tried to dig her fire pit, the water would drown out her fires. Pele continued on to the other islands, Oahu and Maui, Molokai and Lanai. But each time she would dig with her magic stick, the flames would be extinguished. On she went, searching, searching. Then, one day, Pele's quest ended. Her journey was over. She had found her new home on the island of Hawaii. Inside the ever seething crater of the volcano Kilauea. And there she dwells to this day. Hawaiian mythology abounds with legends about Pele's terrifying rages. When rebuffed or offended, she would hurl her fire and molten stone from her lair beneath the earth, and her enemies would be consumed. In this way, the islands were formed by the creative rage of Pele. Today, scientists can accurately forecast when volcanoes will erupt. It can even be said that scientists are able to predict Pele's changing moods. These predictions provide warnings that can save lives. In 1983 and 84, more than a dozen evacuated homes were destroyed by Kilauea's molten flows. In 1986, Pele's fury carved a path of destruction all the way to the sea. A study of these eruptions reveals how the Hawaiian Islands were formed. The Earth has an inner core and an outer core. Together, they are a little more than 4,000 miles in diameter. Surrounding the outer core is the Earth's mantle, about 1,800 miles thick. Most of it's at an extremely high temperature. Above the mantle is the crust from 5 to 50 miles thick. Occasionally, molten materials from the mantle invade the crust. Pressure builds in the magma beneath the surface. When the pressure becomes greater than the surface strata can tolerate, gases, fire, and molten stone are hurled into the air, sometimes as high as 2,000 feet. Then, through fissures and vents, rivers of lava cascade down the mountain. In the case of the Hawaiian Islands, this volcanic activity started to occur beneath the ocean floor some 38 to 43 million years ago. With each eruption, lava welled out from fissures and the mountains grew higher and higher. Eventually, they emerged from the sea and created islands. This process explains how an island is formed. But what about the island chain? Scientists believe that the Earth's surface is composed of a series of movable slabs called tectonic plates. They average about 50 miles thick and float on the mantle. These plates move very slowly. The Pacific plate moves about four inches a year. As the plate moves over hot spots in the mantle, 
lava erupts through it, eventually creating a new island. Since the plate is always moving, the process is repeated over and over. Hawaii is the farthest east and the youngest of the Hawaiian Islands. It is still growing. Since 1983, Kilauea has been in nearly continuous eruption. And with each eruption, Hawaii grows slightly larger. In 1960, lava flowing from Kilauea extended Hawaii some 1,500 feet closer to California. Much of this expansion occurs when lava flows from land into the sea. When it is first hurled to the surface, Lava is smooth, ropey, and fluid. It is called pahoi hoi and can cause massive destruction. As the lava moves farther from its source, it loses gases and heat. It often becomes jagged and rough. This form of lava is called aa. After an eruption, all is desolation. Yet in time, from this destruction comes new life. Because lava fields are rich in nutrients, as long as moisture is available, new life begins to grow as soon as the lava has cooled. Hawaii's black sand beaches are of volcanic origin. This beach was created within four months as lava exploded into tiny fragments when it met the water. The waves washed the fragments ashore and pounded them into sand. North of these ebony shores lies Hilo, the largest city on the Big Island, a cane field town huddled around the crescent of Hilo Bay. The major commercial area of Hilo is called Kaiko'o, or Rough Seas. It is aptly named because giant waves have come roaring into Hilo. Called tsunami, the waves are triggered by undersea earthquakes. In 1960, one such giant wave, some 35 feet high, nearly destroyed the town. Each morning in Hilo, at the Suisan fish market, fishermen auction off their catch of the day. Yellowfin tuna, aku, snapper, vahoho, mahi-mahi, and other treasures of the sea. The market supplies many local restaurants and groceries. To the rhythmic chant of the auctioneer, some 6,000 pounds of fish are sold during the fishing season. By mid-morning, the catch of the day is ready to become that evening's blue plate special. The moist tropical air around Hilo makes anthuriums and orchids flourish on flower farms. Each week, a million blossoms are shipped to the Orient and to the U.S. mainland. Anthuriums are the most popular of Hawaiian flowers because when cut, they can live as long as three weeks. The colors of the heart-shaped blossoms range from white to orange to deep red. 
Orchids grow in almost endless variety. Since these remarkable plants have the unusual ability to cross with other orchids of a completely different genera, there are some 25,000 species. Heliconias belong to the banana family. The showy parts are really modified leaves. Inside them are the actual flowers. Sloping to the sea in the hills above Hilo are orchards of macadamia trees. The delicious nuts are an island specialty. The first macadamia trees were brought to the Big Island from Australia in 1881. The nuts, when covered with chocolate, make a candy of world renown. North of Hilo, on the slopes of Mauna Kea, where the trade winds bring rain-filled clouds, lies a wilderness garden of tropical splendor. Here, the tumbling waters of Akaka Falls plummet some 442 feet. North of Akaka Falls, the rugged Hamakua coast is dotted with small towns bearing melodic names, such as Lapohoi Hoi, Honohina, and Ookala. These communities offer a timeless tableau of rural life, people living much as their forebears did generations ago. But the remote coastal reaches leading downward to the Waipio Valley, are home to only a few people. This is the Hawaii where time ticks slowly and passes with reluctance. On the northern base of Mauna Kea are scenes that seem stolen from Texas, Arizona, or from Wyoming. The origins of this cattle ranch go back to Captain Vancouver. He brought the first cattle to the islands in 1793. Within 20 years, cattle roamed over northern Hawaii, threatening crops and lives. In 1815, John Parker, a New England seaman, was hired to round up the cattle. The reward for his efforts? Two acres of land, the modest beginning of what is today the largest privately owned cattle ranch in America. 250,000 acres. Members of the Parker family have owned the ranch for six generations. The grandfathers of many of today's ranch hands learned their trade from Spanish-speaking Mexican cowboys brought to Hawaii to teach their skills. The Hawaiian cowboys nicknamed themselves Paniolos after the Espanols. To this day, cowboys of the islands are called Paniolos. Life on this ranch is much like life on a ranch on the U.S. mainland. There are more than 50,000 cattle and some 600 horses to attend to. Work begins before dawn. At branding time, 500 calves will have been marked by 8 a.m.
The Espanoles who taught the Hawaiians to rope and brand the wild cattle of the ranch are long gone, but they left something important. They left their guitars. As the Hawaiians adapted the instrument for their own music, they developed a system of tuning down or slackening the strings. One of the masters of slack key guitar is Raymond Kane. Slack key enables the guitars to play both the melody line and bass line on the same instrument. It is very personal and distinctly Hawaiian, one of the best expressions of the aloha spirit. <laughs> On the Kona, or western coast of Hawaii, ranch land gives way to the only place in the United States where coffee is grown commercially. The first seeds for coffee trees were brought to Kona by missionaries in 1828. Hawaii's soil and climate proved ideal, and coffee soon became an important commercial crop. Today, coffee is grown on the other islands as well, but the coffee of Kona ranks among the finest in the world. The port of Kailua is the starting point for some of the world's most exciting deep sea fishing. The most sensational catch is the Pacific Blue Marlin. It can weigh in at well over half a ton. It was on the nearby beach at Kealakakua Bay that Captain Cook, the most famous explorer of his time, landed in 1779 on a return voyage to Hawaii. The Englishman had discovered the isles the year before, naming them the Sandwich Islands in honor of the Earl of Sandwich. These specks of land in the vast Pacific would be among the last significant discoveries by Western explorers. During the return visit, Captain Cook and a local chief had a tragic disagreement over a missing longboat. A skirmish ensued, and a number of Hawaiians and English sailors were killed. Among the dead was Captain Cook, the man who had opened the Hawaiian Islands to European settlement. South of Kealakakua Bay, a tongue of land points towards Hawaiki, the legendary motherland. Here is the largest of the places of refuge, a vital part of ancient Hawaiian culture. The early Hawaiians governed themselves by a set of sacred rules called kapu. Women were forbidden to eat with men. The shadow of a commoner could not fall across the house of a chief. The penalty for breaking a kapu was death. The only way to escape punishment for such crimes was to flee and seek sanctuary in a place of refuge. Some fugitives had to swim miles to escape their avengers. When the fugitives were inside the gates, the kahuna, or ruling priests, would absolve them of their crimes. Nearby, but a culture away, is St. Benedict's Catholic Church, a temple for the new religion brought by the missionaries. 
Built by a Belgian priest in the late 19th century, the church continues its ministry here today. The first missionaries to Hawaii arrived on the Kona coast in 1820. They had traveled thousands of miles by sea from Boston to convert the Hawaiians to their Protestant beliefs. The missionaries brought a new religion and way of life often alien to the islanders. Lacking a common language with their hosts, the missionaries often painted images of the new faith on church walls. As you said to your apostles, I give you peace. My peace I always leave you. Do not look on our sins, only look on the faith of all your people. Then you give us the peace and the unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus. In their zeal, the missionaries tried to eradicate many elements of traditional Hawaiian culture. But today, churches recognize the importance of blending the old and the new. Once a month, some churches celebrate Sunday Mass with traditional Hawaiian music and the sacred hula. sanctuaries, the painted church and the place of refuge, close together in miles, yet so distant in spirit. Here is the blending of cultures that has shaped these islands. Two holy places the new and the old. The west and the east. From the first Polynesian navigator, the most recent sunset. According to our legends, Lanai was once inhabited only by ghosts and evil spirits. And so for many years, after the people settled other islands, Lanai remained deserted. Then Kaululaau, nephew of the king of Maui, was sent to Lanai to drive the ghosts from the island. At night, he hid from the evil spirits in caves. And during the day, he hunted them down. Soon, with the evil spirits gone, it was safe for the living to make their home on Lanai. Lanai is still sparsely populated. What the island lacks in population, however, is more than made up for by the number of pineapples. Fields of the fruit are everywhere. Pineapples were brought to the islands from South America and the West Indies, and at least one variety was reportedly growing in Hawaii as early as 1813. When James Dole, a descendant of a missionary family, began to market pineapples to the US mainland in 1903, 
few realized that the cultivation of the fruit would become one of Hawaii's primary sources of income. In 1922, Dole's Hawaiian Pineapple Company purchased the Lanai Ranch Company for a little more than $1 million. This would seem to be a bargain, for the Lanai Ranch Company encompassed the entire island of Lanai. Today, Little Lanai, only 18 miles long and 13 miles wide, is the home of what may be the largest pineapple plantation in the world. Pineapples grow slowly. A new crop needs almost two years from planting to harvest. The ripe fruit must be picked by hand. Most of the crop is then shipped to Oahu for canning. An early Spanish explorer named this new world fruit, piña, because of its resemblance to the pine cone. Although pineapple is king on Lanai, another piña, the Norfolk Island pine, has also become a trademark of the island. In the early 1900s, the New Zealand naturalist, George C. Munro, was manager of the old Lanai Ranch. As he rode horseback through the mountains, he often sowed seed from his saddlebags, hoping to create windbreaks and to extend Lanai's natural forests. On the eastern shore of Lanai, lie Hulopoe Beach and Manalei Bay. The quiet waters of Manalei Bay provide a calm anchorage for pleasure craft. Hulopoe Beach is the most beautiful of the beaches on Lanai. Since few tourists visit Lanai, it remains a favorite recreation spot for the local people. From Lanai on a clear day, you can see many of the other Hawaiian islands. To the north is the sleepy little island of Molokai. Molokai remains one of the least spoiled of the islands. Through the centuries, the island has always been a sanctuary, a haven for the training of Hawaiian kahuna, or wise ones. The Pali Coast on the northern shore is as rugged a coastline as can be found anywhere on Earth. The misty Halava Valley on the eastern tip of Molokai is thought to have been the site of one of Hawaii's earliest settlements, about 650 AD. The fertile valley once supported a thriving community of taro farmers, but in 1946, a 31-foot tidal wave swept into the mouth of the valley, leaving a salty residue that put an end to agriculture. On the southern shore is Kapua Iva, one of the last remaining royal coconut groves. Planted in the mid-19th century, the grove once contained a thousand trees and was reserved for the king. The grove is very stately and serene, but when the wind blows, it's risky to walk beneath these trees. Nearby, tiny St. Joseph's Church was built by the Belgian priest who became a living legend in Hawaii, Father Damien. He came to Molokai to care for the island's lepers. No one knows when the dreaded disease first came to the islands, but by the mid-1800s, leprosy was an epidemic. The government decided to quarantine all lepers, the afflicted were shipped to Kalaupapa, an isolated peninsula on Molokai's northern coast. Death was the only escape. Dwelling in caves or makeshift huts with no medical care and meager food, the 
patients lived in unspeakable sorrow until the arrival of Father Damien in 1873. Not only did Father Damien provide for the lepers' physical needs, he gave them hope. Today, visitors are permitted at Kalaupapa. Although it can be reached by small plane, the most memorable route is a two and a half mile mule ride down fortress-like cliffs that once enforced the banishment. Okay, good morning, folks. I want to welcome you to the island of Molokai and to the Molokai mule ride. My name is Yupo. I'll be one of the mule skinners going down with you today. I'm going to tell you a little something about the trail and about the company and what to expect down in the settlement. Kalaupapa is about two and a half miles wide and about two and a quarter mile long. The population down there is about 130 people. Out of that 130, there's 93 patients left in the settlement. The rest are state and federal workers and the hospital staff. That's the only people allowed to live in the settlement, no one else. The most visited site at Kalaupapa is St. Philomena's Church, built by Father Damien. It has become a lasting monument to his life his work, and his sacrifice. For in 1889, Father Damien died of the disease that had brought him to Kalaupapa, and he was buried beside the church. Richard Marx is Kalaupapa's honorary sheriff and tour guide. He is also the third generation of his family to suffer from leprosy and live in Kalaupapa. Father Damien came here after he uh, found out about the leprosy problem in Hawaii because he had a big parish on the big island of Hawaii. And over the years, they were taking some of his people away as lepers and bringing them here. And somebody asked him once, what do you bother with lepers? And he had the perfect answer. Why did our Lord bother with lepers? And to him, that was the only answer he ever needed. Despite all the grim reminders of death, the story of Kalaupapa is more triumph than tragedy. Today, leprosy can be controlled with multidrug therapy, making quarantine unnecessary. Few patients now remain in the colony. Well, Kalapapa is a dying community. No new patients have been brought in since 1969. Our children are not allowed to live here. So we've got an aging population. There are no more active cases here. The visitor's program has increased public awareness of leprosy, now called Hansen's disease, but Richard Marx would rather change attitudes than names. And I don't mind being called a leper, but a lot of our people get very angry when you use the word leper. And they don't like the idea of leprosy. They come with the deal of a Hansen's disease. I, for one, don't think you change anything by changing the name. And so I'm a holdout for the word leprosy. Residents of the colony can remain until the end of their lives. Eventually, the peninsula will become a national park, a poignant tribute to Father Damien and to the patients. On Molokai, a large percentage of the residents are of Hawaiian ancestry, more than 3,000 in a population of 6,700. Today, in East Molokai, there's a wedding, and preparations are underway for a luau. A luau is the perfect occasion for the community to renew its ties. Most people on Molokai know each other, and many are related. But it takes an event such as a birth or a wedding to bring them all together. 1,000 guests are expected to show up for this celebration. Luau's are staged daily for visitors to Hawaii, but it is rare to experience a community luau. Cooking begins days in advance. The most traditional Hawaiian dish is kalua pig. It's cooked in an imu, an earthen pit lined with kiave wood. Heated lava rocks are placed in the pit along with a whole pig. The pig steams slowly in the moist oven. 
When it is dug up several hours later, it is a succulent delicacy. Cooking in an emu is a family affair. Everyone's help is needed. No luau is complete without poi, Hawaii's fluid bread. Traditionally, it is made by pounding cooked taro root, but modern know-how has given Hawaii instant poi, just mixed with water. The eating of poi is a kind of folk ballet, accompanied by strict etiquette. Dip the fingers to the first joint. Never pull the hand roughly through poi. Rotate the fingers and wave gracefully to keep the poi from falling off. And remember to smack the lips gently. Once the bridal couple and their entourage arrive, there's a brief blessing of the food, then the feasting begins. Like weddings everywhere, sharing food with family and friends is an important tradition, a way of sharing the promise of a new life and of new beginnings. Molokai has always been a tranquil haven of spectacular natural beauty, where family ties and old ways are cherished Today, it is a place where the visitor may experience the unspoiled dream of Hawaii. Nine miles southeast of Molokai is Maui. The second largest of the Hawaiian islands, Maui encompasses more than 728 square miles. Dominating the island is the now dormant volcano Haleakala, meaning the house of the sun. The Hawaiians believe that the Polynesian god Maui dwelled here. Maui was a trickster hero in Polynesia. When he came to these seas, he accomplished three remarkable feats. His first was to fish up the islands from the ocean floor. On another occasion, Maui was thirsty. He told the woman that if she would give him a drink from her gourd, he would push up the sky for her. She complied, and he thrust the sky upward, where it has remained to this day. But his greatest feat was accomplished from the rim of Haleakala. Maui noticed that because the sun moved so quickly across the sky, his mother was having trouble drying her strips of bark cloth. Men had too little time to harvest their crops. So Maui wove a strong cord of coconut fiber. He then snared the sun and made it promise to move more slowly across the sky so there would be more daylight hours on Earth. At sunrise, as you stand on the rim of Haleakala Crater, staring down into its dark abyss, it is not difficult to understand why the ancients believed that the gods dwelled here. Each morning, when the seven and a half mile long crater fills with clouds, you feel you are experiencing the dawn of creation. As the morning progresses and sunlight dips into the crater, rivers of frozen lava and ancient cinder cones emerge from the purple shadows. After a visit to Haleakala, 
Mark Twain wrote that he felt like the last man, neglected of the judgment, left pinnacled in mid-heaven, a forgotten relic of a vanished world. On the heights of the volcano is a plant that grows nowhere else in the world except on Maui and on the big island, Hawaii. The silver sword is a member of the sunflower family. It blooms only once during its lifetime of between four and 25 years. Then, having produced the seeds of a new generation, the silver sword dies. Haleakala is also the home of the nene, the Hawaiian state bird. Because it lived for centuries without natural predators, it is fearless. Its daring attitude led the birds to the brink of extinction. But through conservation efforts, there are now more than 150 nene living on the volcano. Along the eastern skirts of Haleakala, a narrow road winds through green cloaked cliffs and groves of tropical trees. A three hour drive leads to the small settlement of Hana Town. Clustered around a perfect bay, Hana has managed to retain much of its rural quality. Despite the town's growing popularity, life here still reflects the grace and warmth of the local people. A short distance south of Hana lies one of the most beautiful spots on Maui, the pools of Ohe'u. Those who explore this natural garden, sometimes referred to as the Seven Pools, discover there are actually more than 30 pristine pools that cascade to the sea. Each winter, as they have long before recorded time, the great humpback whales return to their calving grounds in the seas of Maui. After a journey of 2,800 miles from Alaska, they arrive in the crystalline waters off Maui's western coast, where they will remain until May. The 40-ton leviathans were once masters of the sea, but in time they would meet their match, the whaling ships of Lahaina. In the early to mid-19th century, this former capital of the Hawaiian Islands became an important anchorage for the Pacific whaling fleet. After their long voyages, crews swarmed ashore in pursuit of rum, women, and other earthly pleasures. When Protestant missionaries in Lahaina prevented women from swimming out to the whaling ships, the angry sailors rioted and fired cannonballs on the town. So the chiefs of Maui built a fort to protect Lahaina. Its ruins are still here today. Built at the turn of the century, the Pioneer Inn is a Lahaina landmark. The original house rules reflect its honky-tonk past. Only on Sunday can you sleep all day. The discovery of oil in Pennsylvania in 1859 signaled the end of the great whaling era. Whale oil yielded to petroleum. Lahaina had already given way to Honolulu as the kingdom's new capital. 
Just west of Lahaina are the verdant walls of the Iao Valley, a place of pilgrimage since ancient times. The soaring 2,250 foot Iao Needle was created by rainwater as it eroded the weaker stone away from the core of basalt. Beyond the needle, on the windward side of the West Maui Mountains, lie inviting beaches strung like pearls upon the shore. Ho'okipa Beach is a haven for surfing. Nobody knows for sure when the Polynesians first rode the seas on their wave sliding boards, but it's an ancient sport, and Hawaiian chants suggest that it was practiced as early as the 15th century. The first surfboards, crafted from koa wood, weighed as much as 150 pounds, a formidable burden by today's standards, but not for the 300-pound surfing champions of ancient Hawaii. Windsurfing is a more recent development, the marriage of the sail and the surfboard. As fine as the surf is on Maui, it is unsurpassed on the island of Oahu. Places such as Banzai Pipeline and Waimea Bay live on in surfing legend. Oahu is said to mean the gathering place in the Hawaiian language. Although this translation is sometimes challenged, no more appropriate name could exist, especially for Hawaii's grandest city, Honolulu. Spreading its skirts over 25 miles of Oahu's leeward shore and inland to the Ko'olau mountain range, the city is a gracious host to visitors from around the world. In downtown Honolulu, Iolani Palace, completed in 1882, is the only official royal residence in America. It was the home of King Kalaakaua, and later of his sister, Queen Liliokalani, the last reigning monarch in a long dynasty. In 1893, a group of American and European businessmen, backed by American Marines, abolished the monarchy. Most of the palace furniture was sold at auction, and the building fell into disrepair for nearly a century. When it was opened to visitors in 1978, most of the palace had been restored to its original splendor. Every Friday at noon, the Royal Hawaiian Band performs in the old coronation stand on the palace grounds. The band was organized in 1836 and has performed regularly ever since. Monarchies may fade away, but the band plays on.
Across the street from the palace is the Kawaiahao Church, an enduring symbol of Hawaii's missionary past. Mali'i Kalama, a lay minister of the church, is also an accomplished quilt maker. Quilting is a legacy left by the missionaries. With scraps of fabric, they taught Hawaiian women how to stitch quilts. The sewing sessions became social occasions. Soon, the skillful Hawaiians were creating their own unique designs. It just happened that at twilight one evening, the, as the sun was setting, it threw a shadow of a coconut tree on the sand. And there was a woman in the group that saw it, and she felt, now that would make a very interesting coverlet. And so she began to cut out material that was given to her by the missionary women, and she cut out the first pattern. From then on, all of the women began to create in their own way different designs, taking nature into consideration. The leaves, the flowers, the fruit, and things of that sort. And that's how it became quite popular in the islands. Recently, there has been a resurgence of interest in this beautiful art form, an art form inspired by the natural world of the islands. One of the most photographed natural wonders on Oahu is Diamond Head, the remnant of an extinct volcano. British sailors named this headland for the stones they found that resembled diamonds. Though the diamonds proved to be only calcite crystals, the name Diamond Head lives on today. At Waikiki, nature has conspired to create the playground of the Pacific. At the foot of Diamond Head lies a golden crescent of beach that was once a retreat for Hawaii's kings. But Waikiki is more than one of the world's most famous beaches. At night, Waikiki is an exuberant world of shops and galleries, neon and gardens and bistros, a sophisticated carousel of pleasures, alive with music and people from all corners of the globe. Off the eastern shore of Oahu, are the waters of Hanauma Bay. It was formed when the sea eroded the crater of an extinct volcano, creating a great tropical aquarium. Among the species in this gallery of living art are the millet seed, butterfly, raccoon butterfly, and the parrotfish. Most of the fish seem unafraid, even curious, as they approach these blue-clad visitors. North of Honauma Bay can be found the masters of the winds that sweep the windward cliffs of Makapu'u Point. There are trade winds in Hawaii so powerful and consistent that flights of more than 25 miles have been recorded. One daring soul remained aloft for 34 hours. Honolulu is a city of many moods. Here at Pearl Harbor, 
the USS Arizona Memorial rises above the battleship in which more than 1,000 men lost their lives at the start of World War II. Above Honolulu, in a former volcanic crater, is the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. Also known as Punchbowl, it is the resting place for more than 34,000 servicemen and women who sacrificed their lives in America's wars. On Memorial Day, families come to honor their loved ones. The Hawaiians call this crater Puowaina. It means Hill of Sacrifice. It was an appropriate name then, and it is certainly an appropriate name now. For this Hill of Sacrifice has become an altar where we may forever keep alive the deepest and most sacred hopes of mankind. It is a place where we come to renew our commitment to a just and good environment for all of mankind. Great markers here in Pu'uwena. The names etched in the marble walls all give testimony to the precious price that has been paid by Americans for more than 200 years to secure the blessings we enjoy today in a land of freedom, a land of liberty, a land of equality. The mountains of the Ko'olau Range divide Honolulu and windward Oahu. Here, along the cliffs of Nu'uanupali, there are stories of fallen warriors from an earlier time. Legends tell of night marches, spirits of a great army that once met defeat here. The victor was Hawaii's greatest king, Kamehameha I. In 1795, Kamehameha forced some 800 warriors of Oahu to the edge of the cliff where they fell to their deaths on the rocks below. The 
memory of Kamehameha is still revered by the people of Hawaii nearly 200 years later. Today, legends about the great king are still told, old stories sung in a contemporary Hawaiian style. Kamehameha was born in a small village on the big island of Hawaii. It was a stormy night, and there was a strange white star with a tail of white fire in the heavens to the west. Priests prophesied that the child would grow up to defeat the established order, so secret plans were made to have the infant killed. But like Moses, Kamehameha was hidden in a basket, covered with bark cloth, and his life was spared. Like most legends, there is a great deal of truth in the song. For it is possible that Kamehameha was born in 1759 and that the white star in the legend could have been Halley's Comet, which was visible in Hawaii that year. Kamehameha was to unite the islands under one rule and reign over a long period of peace. Each year in June, Honolulu holds a festival to honor the great warrior king who brought unity and peace to the islands. Huge garlands of tea leaves, plumeria, orchids, and other flowers from all of the islands are draped over the king's statue. More than 20,000 flowers are woven into these memorial lays. King Kamehameha Day was first celebrated in 1872, and a parade has been held regularly since 1916. The festival is a powerful example of how the past remains alive in contemporary Hawaii. The monarchy is gone, but the people remember their royal heritage. Kamehameha Day is more than a parade. It is the story of a remarkable people who dwell at the center of the sea. A celebration of their art and song, legend and music. Here are the Hawaiians themselves and their marvelous diversity. The heroes who have lived the legends of these islands and the young who will live their future. Each of these islands is a separate stone in a beautiful mosaic. Together they form something larger and finer still. Hawaii, the realm of Pele. Maui, place of the house of the sun.
Oahu, the gathering place. Night, the Pineapple Isle. Molokai. Friendly Isle. Kauai, the Garden Isle. First navigators left their homes in Polynesia. Could they have imagined where their voyage would lead? That the stars they followed across the trackless tides would take them to Hawaii, to America's state of paradise.